So Gay, just looking up at TJ, your dad, uh, everything here, just, we were just being talking about off camera, just, it, 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 it talks to aspiration, perspiration, history. Very much history. And Dad uh, came from very humble beginnings, Tim, and he aspired to be the greatest trainer in Australia and was able to do it. And he bought Tullock Lodge many, many years ago. Uh, and then after that, he built on that and he built an empire. And uh, I tried to replicate in, in many ways uh, one, I tried to follow in his training tracks, and I, I've done to a certain extent. Uh, no one will ever be as great as he was, because just as we were speaking before, you know, they're hard, they're hard shoes to fill. But he, uh, he was a perfectionist, he was attention to detail, and that went right from everything, from the way he dressed, to the way he trained his horses, to the way the, way the horses went to the races, and that very much as a stamp of Tullock Lodge, and of Adrian Bott and Gay Waterhouse Racing. You've done an amazing job to carry on that legacy. And look, you're only a preschooler. You were three years old when, when Tullock was doing what Tullock was doing in, in 1957 as the Dragons were winning their competitions or a year after the Olympic Games. What did your father tell you, and your mother to that extent, about Tullock, this horse that raised the, the spirits of a nation in so many ways? He certainly did. And he's here on the wall just behind us. And he literally turned Dad's career around. Uh, I often asked him, I said, you know, what was your greatest horse? What, was it Tullock or, or, or was it Kingston Town? He said, Gay, Tullock came at a stage in my life where I really needed him financially and I needed him to help me on the road to my success and, and building the, you know, my career. And he said, and Kingston Town came after that. So he said, I suppose I have a, a, a spot in my heart for Tullock. But he said, they were the two greatest horses I've ever trained. And they did, both, you know, tying them together, uh, as Winx has done mm. in current generation. Uh, Tullock, just in the, the 50s and 60s, he won the Breeders' Plate, and then he was able to win, uh, uh, you know, uh, the Cox Plate and the, the Caulfield Cup, and, and carrying big, big weights, you know. That's what people, I think, have just completely lost in racing nowadays, that the weight scale was so, so varied and so big. And both those horses you speak about there caught the imagination of the Australian public. So many people of probably my generation will say, Kingston Town, wow, what about the mighty Kingston Town? And then others will talk about Tullock. And, and that's the thing about sport racing, and we're going through a very much an unprecedented time at the moment with COVID-19. It is sport, it is this magic, these magical horses that raise people out of what they're going through. Well, people, um, I think people relate to animals very well. Uh, and uh, horses are they're sort of a majestic creature, aren't they? I mean, they're bigger than us and they go faster, and, uh, unless maybe you're in a sports car, but you know, they go fast and they're big and they're strong. Uh, and, you know, they've got something about them, they've got some magic about them, you know? When did you first go out to the track and, and begin, get your binoculars? Because I've, I've seen you obviously covering races and, you know, you're very uh, focused when you get to the track. When, 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 when did you start like this, following your dad? Well, Dad um, used to take me out on the the the, 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 the baldy pony, which we called Cornflakes, and he'd put me on the front of it, and uh, we'd ride out to the centre of Randwick. And I loved those days. And we'd go after, I've told the story before, but we'd go after through, uh, you know, Centennial Park, and we'd look for duck eggs on the, on the you know, the lake's uh, shore there. And of course the duck egg, uh, I bumped into his pocket one day going home as a kid, and of course squashed the duck egg. Well, it wasn't, of course, mum had put it out each morning for him to take to the track, and then we'd go and look for it after. So it was, you know, it was a lovely sort of uh, relationship I had with my father, it was very nice. It was great fun. You must have picked up a lot in those early days about how to train racehorses. Well, I don't, don't think, first of all, you don't know where you're going to be when you're a little kid. You, you, you uh, just love your parents. If you've got a good relationship with your parents, you, you know, I was an only child, so I had this very close bond with my mum and dad. Uh, and you don't realise what flows over you, be it you with your family, your parents, or me, or any of the people watching this show, what flows over you every morning. At breakfast, Dad would sit opposite me and I'd be having my cornflakes and whatever one had, and uh, Mum would be getting me ready to go to school, uh, and I'd be listening to Dad on the telephone. 
and he'd start his calls at seven o'clock in the morning and he'd be speaking to Sir Tristan Andico, Sir Robert Askin, the Premier of New South Wales, Bob Hawke, the then, you know, he was, uh, became the, the Prime Minister of Australia. All the leading business people in Australia and the, and the movers and shakers of Australia would take the call from TJ in the morning because they either had a horse in training or they wanted a, the, the thoughts on the, the horses racing. You know, we were the most successful horse stable in Australia. So people talked sport, you know, they really talked it. And they wanted to know what was happening in racing. And TJ was at the front of it. And you could do nothing but fall in love with, with we're talking for the Australian Turf Club here, uh, of, of Randwick, of Warwick Farm, of Canterbury and its quirks and Rose Hill. They just, they've all got their own sense of majesty, don't they, these tracks? They certainly do. You know, Australian racing uh, is, is, is very vibrant and very alive. Uh, and, you know, it's changed a lot. Like, you know, when we had uh, so many bookmakers at the track, it was a lot more sort of interaction. And when there was, you know, nowadays there's, there's fewer book makers and there's, uh, there's less betting on, on track. Uh, so that, that side of it's changed. Uh, and, you know, I suppose the form side's changed. People don't study the form. But, but they are great tracks and that when you have the horses, the, the magic sort of comes together. Finally for part one and then we, in this next part we're going to talk about you and, and Piero and Farnham more recently. But how much did that acting training and the acting that you did and the work that you did outside of horse racing put you in good stead for what you went on to do and are doing now? I think it, uh, first of all, it made me very determined uh, because I, I went overseas to further my career as an actress uh, and it made me very determined to succeed. It also gave me, I suppose, great uh, confidence and, and, and presence, which, you know, I'm not a very big person and I, I'm a woman in a man's world. So, you know, you have to project yourself that people don't see you as a woman, that they see you as a trainer or, or you know, and that's how I was. I, I, you know, I am to this day. You know, when I walk on the track, I'm a trainer. When, I, when I'm at home, I'm a, a mother and a, a wife, a mother, a grandmother. You know, I have many facets and it was able to give me the confidence to move forward. And, and when I did come back to Australia, um, I knew where I wanted to go and I, I, I knew what I wanted to do. And it was, you know, it was a tough old uh, road, but it was, it was very rewarding. <laughs>